Welcome back, everybody. Don't go away. It's the the last is always the best, right? We are about to start our final presentation of the second day of the SUNY Online Summit, 25th anniversary. Woo! <laughs> Hello, online community of 300 people. Can you hear me? Are you making dinner yet? Um, good afternoon. My name is Hope Wendell. I'm the director of SUNY COIL. That's Collaborative Online International Learning. I am so excited to, and very curious, to see our next presentation, Using Feminist Pedagogy to Design Learner-Centered Learning Experiences Online. I want to um, welcome our presenters, Dr. Liv Newman, Administrative Assistant Professor and Associate Director of the Center for Engaged Learning and Teaching at Tulane University and Adjunct Faculty for Loyola University, New Orleans. And Jacqueline Tony Howard is an Administrative Assistant Professor of Technology and Women's History at Newcomb Institute of Tulane University. Take it away! <laughs> Hey everyone who has remained, thank you. It's great to have you. Um, and your clapping indicates you still have some energy, which I'm very impressed by. Um, as an opener, because you've been sitting for an hour and the older I get, I can't, I can only sit for like 30 minutes before my back starts hurting. Just if you're interested for like one minute, would you just stand up? And those of you on Zoom, same thing, stand up if you feel like it. If you're in the room, turn to a partner, find a partner or a small group and share, if you had a theme song, what would it be? Those who are on Zoom, you can add it to the chat. Got one minute. Right now, right? It's the first time I've talked to you. What's your theme song? Oh, yeah, we need to have So, <laughs> my learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good one. That's a good song. I love it. That was good. Thank you. Okay, everyone, our minute is up. I hope you got. Did, you, did everyone get to share their song? Okay, everyone got their chance to share. If not, do it real quick. Just the title. You don't necessarily have to give an explanation. All right, if we okay, we're back. Oh my gosh, y'all, you're just like undergrads or third graders. I just I, I have a third grader and a ninth grader and an eleventh grader, but I was just on a field trip with the third grader. And let me tell you, <laughs> we are there's a lot coming at us in the next decade. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being Into here. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Today, we are going to talk about feminist pedagogy and how we use that to design student-centered learning experiences. Part of what we're going to do today is introduce what is feminist pedagogy. We are going to introduce you to several tenets of feminist pedagogy, and then we're going to make this a little active we're going to we're going to make this a little active um, where you're going to discuss and chat and post ideas on a shared brainstorming document. And then after the session, we're available for Q&A um, through various ways. So uh, let's take it away if that's OK. Awesome. I just want to mention for those of you who are on Zoom, we are going to do breakout rooms at the end. So if there is anybody that you do not want to be paired with, if you just please <laughs> private message the moderator. <laughs> You can tell Liv works at SELT, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, this is yours. So 
outcomes for today, at the end of this workshop, you will be able to identify key tenets of feminist pedagogy for teaching and learning, explain how specific feminist pedagogy tenets are relevant to your work, and apply feminist pedagogy tenets to elements of your work. All right, and here are some resources for you. So you can use this QR code to get into this folder, or use the bit.ly link. Um, we have the group brainstorming document for you that we're gonna use later in the um, session, but we also have a collection of worksheets to further your thinking and application of the feminist pedagogy for teaching online tenants. Um, and so this is something that you can do now or you can wait later. Um, and we just wanted to kind of give you a gift so that when you're actually applying Applying this to your work, whatever you're, that in whatever capacity that is, um, these will be helpful for you. We're just going to stay on this for just a few more seconds while everybody's getting there. Can we get some thumbs ups if you're in, if you're there in the room? Okay, great. Does anyone need a few more few more seconds? All right. Okay, so now um, we have a little warm up. We're probably not going to do this for three minutes because we started just a little bit late. So what we're going to do is, um, I think this is Liv. So do you want to take this one? Yeah. So when you think about feminist pedagogy, just thinking about that term, what keywords come to mind? So you may not be familiar with this term. We don't expect you to, but when you you hear it and you think about like what pops into your head most immediately. Those of you who are in the room can share with a partner and those of you who are on Zoom can add to the chat. We'll give you about a minute and a half, two minutes to share. I like to I always assume people are going to be like women, right? Girls, but like what I was surprised me about this tiger shoot is about power, right? Like about domination. Yeah. Um, oppression. Oppression. That's usually the framework from which. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like subordination. Yeah. Yeah. So still power, really. Yeah. Right. Um thinking like empire. Yeah. And then like and then and then also empower. Yeah, empower. Like and especially like empowering yeah. empower. I like that. And whatever that may be for that. Exactly. Oh, I like that. All right, you have about another 30 seconds to share. All right. If we could come back together, that would be great. Okay. So a big um, feminism often has a lot of misconceptions. Um, and in fact, whenever we um, openly come into rooms and say that we're, we are feminist teachers, people bring a lot of baggage into their understanding of what that means. So for us, um, a lot of times feminism is misunderstood as being about women and girls. Um, that is definitely a part of feminism. But when we talk about feminism, we're talking about examining power. So for me, this um, Liv and I were sharing. And for me, this is about thinking about domination and subordination. Liv, do you want to share yours? And for me, my keywords were oppression, undoing oppression, and empowerment. So this for us is really about who has power, who do you give power to, um, and who takes power back. Um, feminism becomes intersectional when we use multiple social frameworks as a rubric for measuring that power question. So race, class, sexuality, and disability and ability. 
Um, feminist pedagogy is a framework for addressing power in teaching and learning. It's it a part of that is teaching feminism to students, but that's not that's just such a small little sliver of the tenants. The biggest tenant is this idea of addressing power in teaching and learning. So as an overview, there are some points that we wanted to share with you. Um, feminist pedagogy is related to critical pedagogy and the work of Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire, as well as others, those two authors and others, you're more than likely well aware of being educators, um, critiques traditional notions of teaching and learning. Feminist pedagogy destabilizes classroom power dynamics. It rejects hierarchy hierarchizing um, of ways of knowing in which the feminine is often considered irrational, unreliable, um, etc. Feminist pedagogy recognizes that knowledge and reality is socially constructed and that classrooms are spaces of co-creation. It is intentionally reflective and responsive, but just as much um, and just as much practical as well as philosophical and is change or action oriented. Okay, so um, I'm going to get out of this real quick. Um, but we, so how Liv and I came together is that we work together. Sorry, this is not our presentation. Here we go. Uh, we work together um, to create this feminist pedagogy for teaching online guide. And um, we work with um, three other editors to manage this guide. And we have an upcoming book project coming out um, on this topic. So we're really excited about that. Um, but part of this guide came out as a as a response to COVID because we we were seeing a lot of the uh, materials that were being put out to students uh, or to, I'm sorry, to professors it was very top down. It was like record your lecture here and then go do this quiz. And it was just very much about power and the teacher holding that power. And so we, we felt like a lot of online um, instructional designers and um, teachers who had been doing this work for a very long time were being ignored. So we have our tenants here. Um, and so we have quite a few. We're only going to be going over these four today, the ones that specifically involve the online environment, but there's a lot more out there. Then we have um, ways that you can get involved either by um, sharing a blog post with us, um, short form writing, this is peer reviewed, um, or you could share your annotated assignments. So if you have assignments that you feel fit within those tenants, or you just wanna see what a feminist assignment might look like, um, we have a, a growing library here of different types of assignments. We're really looking for um, we want all disciplines, um, but it's something that we have gaps in our literature is on STEM. So if there's any um, STEM people out there who want to, to contribute, but please, everyone is welcome to contribute. Um, we also have a literature section. This is what started the guide was um, we wanted to see what literature was out there about feminist pedagogy. Um, and so uh, we have resources about what people have been saying about online feminist pedagogy since 2008. And that's when I got into online. So um, I, it's really exciting to see. We also are starting to turn all of this into a database, which is there. We have tools um, and just many ways that you can get involved. One of our favorite things right now is our liberatory pedagogies page. Um, this is coming together where we're starting to talk about intersectionality, intersectionality, meaning how does feminism relate to anti-racist pedagogy? How does it relate to disability pedagogy, liberatory, queer, uh, reproductive rights and justice, and critical data justice? So all of these things uh, matter, and we have a lot in common with people who are working in those areas too. So shout out to them. All right, go back to the here we go. So you can get to the guide here. You can follow us um, on all the social media, um, but please feel free to join us. All right, this is mine too. So one of the main tenets for um, online learning is humanizing online learning and teaching. This is often a complaint I got um, as an instructional designer and instructional technologist. Something I was always working towards was how do I humanize this? And then later as an online teacher. So the idea behind this is that we the use of strategies and practices to incorporate students and instructors as social agents into the learning process and enable them to feel connected with 
each other. Um, so how I look at this is I like to bring student voices and perspectives into the online classroom. I like them to um, do learning reflections and share those in discussion forums. Um, I see reflection as one of the highest um, the highest orders of thinking, not only doing the work, but then being able to reflect on their work. Um, and so that's one of the ways I do it. Um, for me, my interpretation of this tenant is recognizing the talents, experiences, knowledge, and challenges that each person brings to our collective learning space, because we're all in this space together. Um, in terms of my teaching, one of the learning activities that my students and I engage in is weekly discussion board. In my discussion, in our discussion board, the students write the discussion questions. And they have to be contextualized by a quote, and then we respond to each other's discussion questions. So I'm not the one creating the questions. I'm really giving, removing the power from me as like the knowledge creator and shifting it to the students and allowing them to create this learning space for themselves and for myself. Um, in terms of thinking about those who are not teaching, who might be in this space, um, Humanizing online learning and teaching is thinking about like designing projects collaboratively so no one is alone. And I have here the example, the pandemic pivot. Mm. I was the only person at Tulane Center for Teaching and Learning who had ever taught online when the pandemic hit, which meant I got to develop the five week course that all faculty were going to go through. It was really good. It was really good, but I'm still a little traumatized by it. And my children were home. <laughs> And it was, it was a raucous time for me, lot. but in, in we have in our office realized in, in, uh, um, since then that there are many of us that are siloed and we're the only ones who do a particular thing. And when there is an issue, it becomes that person's sole responsibility. And that can be a real, a real burden. I'm thinking about like the previous speaker and all the procedural changes that may be upcoming it made me nervous and I'm not even responsible for those mm. procedures, but thinking about like, how, who in your office is responsible and is, is carrying or potentially maybe carrying a lot of weight and how can you diffuse that? Um, so we're going to uh, give everybody just a, uh, a one minute um, to think about how this might apply to your work. Um, you can write it down on your own or just think about it. So think about how you can humanize online learning and teaching or your work in the online sphere. Sure. Those are online. You can put it in the chat or you can just jot it down. Yeah, we're not sharing. It's your own reflective period. Oh, yeah, humanizing. So, because we are so excited. Yeah. Because of you trying to help others by offering. Yes. That's right. That's nice. So, that's nice. I'm trying to look like there's a lot going on. Okay. All right. In one minute, we're going to move forward. So the second tenant of feminist pedagogy when we think of teaching and learning online is creating cultures of care. So we have two quotes here. Deacon 2012 writes, feminist pedagogy creates an atmosphere where students know that their teacher is their advocate, someone who's truly and sincerely invested in helping them succeed. And Mott and Bennett 2003 write, it is an ethics of careful recognition of the realities and experiences histories and knowledges of oppressed communities misrepresented in banking renditions of pedagogy as empty and lacking subjects in need of the teacher's expert knowledge. Such attentiveness to holistic caring work with communities and learners also extends to the teacher facilitator who's theorized as an intellectual co-creator of knowledges for democratization and transformation. 
<laughs> All right. So one of the ways I interpret this is I like to create a space for learning and vulnerability, making mistakes and building uh, where students feel comfortable making mistakes and building trust along the way. So I create spaces and assignments um, such as peer review, which we all do peer review, but I really build into this idea that you are going to make mistakes. Your work is not perfect. Um, it will never be perfect. And that our job is to just help you improve and where you are right now is totally fine and that you are your job is to improve your work not get it to some imaginary place of perfection that doesn't exist um so but that's a lot of care work that goes into me saying let's take down this temperature a little bit you're here to learn and for me when i think about my admin the administrative roles i i haven't had have had and have um it's recognizing pressures i think just like 360 degree pressures that we all experience both internal to our institution and external pressures um and practicing self-care for ourselves but also caring for others so i mentioned like our office is rather siloed um and a commitment i am making is to reach out and offer my help and assistance to other members of the team, even when they don't ask. Like 2004 commitment. Um, because I've realized that we're all under a tremendous amount of pressure now professionally and personally. Um, and just reaching out to another person and offering yourself can make a tremendous difference for them. And just as a note, um, in these slides, if you click on that peer review button or the other um, links, um, it will take you to um, our assignments that um, that um, reflect these um, tenants. All right, so another one minute jot. Um, if you, when you think about creating cultures of care, what is one, what are one or two things that you can do or how does this resonate with you and your own work? And this is something you just jot down on your own or reflect on personally. I just wanna give you some time to have that opportunity. So you have one minute. You can chat too. You can chat. Okay, so we're going to come back together. We're going to have more time to kind of put these thoughts on paper. We just wanted to give you a moment to sit with these thoughts next to the tenant. Okay, so the next one is Liz. So the third tenet of feminist pedagogy for teaching online is examining disembodiment. Um, Dreyfus, 2001, um, writes, embodiment, including our emotions, play a crucial role um, for Dreyfus is in our being able to make sense of things so as to see what is relevant, our ability to let things matter to us. And so to acquire skills, um, our sense of the reality of things, our trust in other people. So one of the ways that I, um, I interpret this is seeing uh, classmates as people who like them are connecting with the content. So I like to have students um, try to, I make opportunities for students to try to see that other students are learning things with them, struggling with them, have questions with them. And so I really rely on the discussion forum a lot, which I know is like, so there's a lot of controversy around the discussion forum, but I try to use it in ways that leverages students, um, you know, being able to see other students learn um, through different mechanisms. And for me, one of the assignments that I give in my Race, Racism, and Privilege course is for students to create a zine um, where they are 
creating a counter narrative to dominant stereotypes. So they can choose whatever stereotype they want to focus on and create that narrative. It can be as artistic as they want it to be, but this is a way for me and them to be able to be creative and insert some of themselves into what we are studying. Um, and then they share that out with each other. And you can find a link to that, that learning activity here. I so my assignment is I take um, I assign every or every student self volunteers for a week in which they're going to be the discussion leader and they read the material. This is online, so they read the material, they record a presentation over that material, and then they share that out with their peers. And then their peers create discussion questions that they are then generating um, and generating content. They have questions about the content. That student becomes that peer mentor for the week. Um, the way in which I see this applying to non-teaching labor is, um, and it could be teaching too, is just always being aware of the invisible labor that's happening. For example, um, I work in data science. I'm a historian who works in data science. And I think a lot about data. Um, whenever you see that vi data visualization or these reports that come out, there's a lot of labor that went involved to creating that really nice, shiny report. Um, and so thinking about who does that labor and um, giving a um, creating embodiment around the work that goes behind putting all that data into the LMS, right? The person who's in charge of the spacing, that used to be me. Um, you know, thinking about the, how many hours of work that goes into that, and then you have one student complaint that could like crash it all down, right? So like just being aware that it takes a lot of work to do what we all do. So again, we wanna give you all a chance to sit with this and think about this tenant and how it relates to your work and yourself. So you'll have about a minute and a half to, to do that and you're welcome to write or to chat with a neighbor. Those on Zoom, you can write this out for yourself or include it in the chat. Okay, we can come back now. This is our last one, and then we'll start hearing from you. So this is something I think about a whole lot. Um, how do you use technology intentionally to build communities and to enhance learning? That's the purpose of technology if uh, within this framework of feminism is to build community and enhance learning. Um, so here is a quote from Bates and Poole. Um, and I love like this is from 2003. That means people have been thinking about this for a very long time. This is not new. Um, learning is seen as essentially a social process requiring communication among learner, teacher, and others. This social process cannot effectively be replaced by technology, although technology may facilitate it. So one of the ways that I interpret this is that um, tools need to serve a specific purpose. And so, you know, you don't just, add, as we all know, you don't just add a tool for the sake of adding that tool. Um, and when I teach about technology in my classes, I specifically have conversations around ethics and data privacy. I care a lot about LMSs as machines of surveillance on students, um, in particular using analytics um, as a way to, are you using surveillance for care or are you using surveillance for control? And so um, thinking about if you are using the analytic tool, why? What, what, is, what is the power position that you're trying to play in that situation? 
Um, and the way I sort of have been thinking about this and, and interpret this tenant is like just carefully selecting educational softwares to benefit students and users. Working with faculty, I find there's always a subset who wants the latest, whatever the software is that everyone's buzzing about. And they add it on to their course, not removing anything else from the course, um, not necessarily being aware of the technology's capabilities, not thinking about why they're using it, and it doesn't benefit students. Um, and then in other applications, when you go my office, there's times we do the same thing. It doesn't benefit us um, as, as employees. I have a link here to sort of my thoughts, my internal thoughts. When I design the, um, the I, we use Canvas, when I design a Canvas course for my students. And so I've just shared some of my thoughts that are linked here. You can dive into later. I also think this idea of using technology as power applies very much in the um, in non-teaching work as well, um, especially whenever you're you can use analytics in all sorts of way. But just thinking about analytics as like we hear lots of horror stories about the monitor, you know, like the mouse um, twitcher, you know, and um, people feeling like that people being actually viewed during like test proctoring and all of that kind of um, really surveillance type apparatuses that are put on employees as well. I mean, a lot of that came out of the COVID pandemic. So just thinking about that. So we're going to give you a minute um, to talk about how maybe technology is, um, how, if any of this resonates with you, especially around technology being used as a tool of power and how you can maybe give back some of that power or take back power. All right, hold on to those thoughts because you're going to get some time to be together, to think more deeply about all of the things you've been talking about and bring up some other issues. So in, well, this is a closing, oh yeah, this is our closing slide. Um, do you have, again, the workshop resource folder that's linked here? There's also the QR code and you might be beneficial to uh, um, navigate to that now. If you click on the group brainstorming document, we offered this because in talking about this presentation, I realized when I am at conferences, there's a couple things that happen. One, I take lots of notes um, in whatever I'm given and I go back to my office and I sit the notes on a shelf and I walk away. And I, I plan to incorporate ideas. It looks really good, but then I don't. The second thing that happens is I tend to, like we'll do pair shares and we'll talk but I may not write things down. Like I need time to process in the moment. Um, and so we are offering this brainstorming document as a way for you to process in the moment, but also to use as a catalog of ideas from your colleagues that maybe you will return to. Maybe you won't like me, I'm admitting, <laughs> I probably will not return to this. Um, maybe that'll be another res educational resolution for 2004 for me, but it is a space for you to be able to contribute and then draw and source ideas from each other. So we are gonna give you about, you have about 15 minutes for small group discussion. So for the moderator on Zoom, if you could please prepare breakout rooms of 
two to three people or three to four people, that would be lovely. And via the group brainstorming document or just sit here and chat, you can think about like, do you have any questions about these tenants that you want to pose to one another? Um, what did you think about when you had that opportunity to sit for a minute and reflect? What are you excited about? Like, could you see your yourself and your work reflected in these tenants or reflecting the tenants? And do you foresee any challenges? So we'll give you, you have about 10 minutes to be with each other. And then we can do five minutes of share out if you feel up to it. Or we can do 15 minutes poll group. We'll just gauge and see how it goes. But we wanted to give you time to sit and be with each other and do what I always want to do at a conference, talk to my colleagues more in depth. So if you could please open those breakout rooms, that would be great. Um, so you can reach out to us. We'd really be happy to have. So there was dialogue. a question in Zoom, or not a question, but kind of, a, I guess it's a question. It's from Dustin. And uh, he's, they said, I find that many of my students are hesitant to be part of the course assignment development process. And, uh oh, I lost the chat. Let's see if I can um uh so hesitant to be part of the, the assignment development process what have some of you done to encourage their participation in the process so i a group for, um, yeah send me a question for the whole group yes. to think about it anyone who wants to raise their hand and share that would be awesome yeah i i deal with student resistance quite a bit um in varying forms um and so part of that is i'm i'm while well, i don't necessarily say i am a feminist on my slides um i talk a lot i use these tenets a lot and say we're doing this because we're building a community of learning we're, we're we i care about you i trust you i want you to care about me and trust me and so i try to use this language um from the very first day um so we're building this class because i we're building this i'm including you in this development process because I care about your voice and I care about your ideas. Um, so using these key words to kind of make that connection um, is a way I get around that. But I never say I'm a feminist pet teacher um, because there's still a lot of sexism in the world that we are dealing with. So one of the things that I was thinking about when I read Dustin's comment was that um, from my own experiences teaching online in trying to be more learner-centered and engage learners in taking responsibility for their own learning and co-creating the learning community with me, that you have to help them unlearn some of their yeah. passivity. Yeah. And, and you have to be very patient with that because they get mad. They do. Like they will say, I don't want to do this. I want you to tell me what to do. Yes. And I, I, my other professors don't make me do this. Or why can't we just have a midterm and final? Or why do I have to iterate? Or why can't I just not do the discussion? I'll still get 80% of the grade. You know what I mean? It's and you busy have, work. And you have to be super patient yeah. to help them understand that they are in control and to build trust and community in that process. Yeah. So it's it's complicated because your own shit's in, your own stuff's in the way. Um, it gets it can get in the way, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I've yeah. gotten irritated about things, right? Um, but anyway, it's it's super, super interesting to me how, you know, so I feel like my online students are willing to take the journey with me. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe it's because they've self-selected into race, racism, and privilege, and they want they want this journey. My face-to-face -face students have I've had more resistance there. And so now I've started telling them, I'm telling you this, and some of you are gonna think I'm a horrible person because many colleagues at Julian think I'm crazy when I say this, but I tell them the first week of school that I think grades are bogus. Me too. That I have to assign that I went in, in grad school, everyone got an A. Like you got an A. If you got a B, it was like the equivalent of an F, but you still got to pass and no one ever got a C. It was very rare. And then I wish undergrad was like this and that I have to assign a grade because I'm bound to do so. But that in the space we're in, I don't want us to think about the grades and everything in the class is designed so that you can get the grade you want because you can revise anything at any time. 
I try and kind of downplay that a little bit, but I have not had any issues with every with lots of students submitting at the end. But I feel like just saying that gives them the permission to be like, oh, okay, I'm not tied to the grade. It's okay if I explore and take a chance or don't do something right because I can revise. And I feel like a little bit of resistance has yeah. left. But also like even the, the discussion board where they pose the questions, they do it, but they know they're still getting a grade. So it's still within the, the confines that are comfortable for them because this is the way they've been taught to learn for over a decade, but it still gives them freedom to play within those confines, if that makes any sense. I feel like that was a lot at once. Thank you all so much, everybody. We really appreciate your time. We don't want to take too much of your time, but we'll be around. Um, and thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, everyone. Um, this was the last session of the day, last but not least. Thank you to Liv and to uh, Jackie for coming all the way from Tulane to um, hang out with us. I hope you'll take the opportunity um, to uh, seek them out later this evening. Um, so, oh my goodness. So speaking of theme song, I have to play it again, Chrissy. Where the heck is it? Um, I have to, I have to, because we have to like close us out with, with, uh, with music, right? Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Let's do it. Come on. All right, everyone. Here it is. Oh my God, I love that so much. I can't even tell you. Thank you, Chrissy, for doing that. Happy anniversary to all of us. Um, I am looking forward to, I don't know, the next 30 years. What's going to happen? Am I still going to be here? I still won't have white hair, though. <laughs> I'm super old, <laughs> um, but no white hair. Um, thanks, Marie, for moderating. Thanks to all of our virtual audience for hanging in with us and for um, for being there from all over. We had people from all over the world, um, you know, over 100 participants uh, at some of the various uh, virtual sessions that we did. Thanks for everyone who was here physically. Um, thanks to all of our participants, our award winners, our ambassadors, the staff. Chris for doing all the tech for us who's extraordinary thank you Nancy Motondo who's standing right there without whom this would not happen and uh and to everybody <laughs> that's for you Nancy um thank you everyone this was a wonderful event some of you may be sticking around for the D2L event tomorrow the connection event tomorrow um hope to see you uh then and if not we'll see you online and I hope to see you next year uh again at this and and you know we'll I, we may be in Syracuse and and we may be online and we may be both. So we'll see what happens. But in any case, we will see each other online at, at whatever it is that we do next. Um, thank you again, everyone, so much. And hope have a very nice and safe uh, evening tonight and a safe trip home wherever it is you may be going. And thank you. Thanks very much.